verses 13 through 18, chapter 5. We're going to begin there today, but before we start, let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for today and the opportunity once again to be in the house of God. We thank you, Lord, for your care. We thank you, Lord, for intervention, helping us, Lord, when our bodies are weak and giving us strength. We thank you, God, today for the ability to be in the house of God, to delve further into the Word of God that we might glean some nourishment for our soul. Lord, as we embark upon the uh, continuation of this study, we ask that your power, your presence, and your anointing would rest upon both the teacher and the student. Allow us, Lord, to deliver uh, that which you would have us to deliver and allow the ear of the hearer to be receptive to that which the Spirit of the Lord would speak unto the church. Master, today, and on every part of this study, as we bring this particular book to a close, Lord, let us walk away having not only heard, but having received. And help us, Lord, to live that which we've learned during this time. For we ask it all in the precious name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Praise God. Amen. All right. Last week we had gotten to uh, this portion, which is verses 13 through 18, where we begin to talk about the prayer of faith. And uh, it's funny because uh, a lot of churches teach a so-called sinner's prayer, salvation, which is not in Scripture. The only time you read anything even remotely akin to that would be the term prayer of faith, and that has to do with the sick. In chapter uh, 5, verses 13 through 18, the word of the Lord reads, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins... They shall be forgiven him. I'm going to stop there for the moment. And we're going to just quickly kind of um, overlap a little bit concerning this. This is why we anoint with oil in the church. This is why when the sick, uh, when you're sick, don't ever hesitate to ask for prayer. Don't ever hesitate to ask to be anointed with oil. I spoke about last week, I spoke about the fact that I have a kind of a hard set rule that I follow when it comes to anointing with all. And I've done this for as many years as I've been in ministry. From my very first church, I've had this principle in my spirit and I cannot break away from it, no matter how hard I want to sometimes. The Word of God tells us, first of all, look at how James' words things it. Is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing, so, uh, sing psalms. In other words, what he's saying is, this should be our immediate and first response. Not our 15th or 20th response. Is any sick among you? Well, let them crab and complain about it. Let them gripe. Let them call somebody and tell them how miserable they feel. No, what you do is when you are sick, you call for prayer. You ask for prayer. And uh, this ought to be our immediate response. And uh, this is why I went on Facebook today and I said, I appreciate all of your prayers, if you would, because I really don't feel very well right now. And... Um, yeah, this microphone, I think the battery is going a little bit dead and we're getting a little pop and zip here going. Unless the kids from uh, Rice Krispies have invaded the microphone. But anyway, so this ought to be our first and immediate response. If you're sick, immediately we ought to turn to the Lord. The first thought in mind ought to be to turn to the Lord. And as Christians, we ought to live uh, a different life, you know, funny, people are funny. A lot of times they don't feel well. The first thing they do is call the doctor. Talk to Jesus first. I'm not saying you can't call the doctor, but talk to Jesus first. Tell the Lord about it first. That ought to be our immediate response. Faith ought to be such a part of our life. And trusting God ought to be such a part of our life that our very first thought in response to sickness and 
illness and not feeling what ought to be, I need to talk to the Lord. Amen. Hold on one second. Let me see. Here we go. Woo, booby, turn oh. It's it should be the number two round one on the left, the little button on the left. Testing one, two. That's way better. Okay, I'm gonna use the, the hardwired one instead. And then turn off, yeah, the wireless, okay? Because that's starting to pop and be very distracting. Okay, so our very first response ought to be, talk to the Lord about it. Go to God about it. I talked about the fact that when my hearing went on July 5th of last year, and I, wo I woke up in the morning stone deaf in my left ear. I mean stone deaf. And uh, I noticed something was strange and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then it dawned on me that I couldn't, I wasn't hearing anything through my left ear, and I blocked my right ear and had the television on. I could not hear a thing. When I blocked my right ear, I could hear nothing. It was dead silent. And I said, oh, dear Jesus, I must have water in my ear or something. And I tried to, you know, do what I could to clear any water that might be in there because we had done gone swimming the night before over there at uh, Jennifer and... Lynn's uh, for the 4th of July outing and uh, anyway tried to clear that up it wasn't going to work and I called uh, Jack and I said we're going to go to Bethel Lighthouse because I need prayer and my first thought was I need to go to the house of God I need to get some people to anoint me with oil and pray for me and we went to Bethel Lighthouse and they anointed me with oil and prayed and it did not immediately clear up. I did not get an instantaneous miracle. And uh, so I went ahead and made arrangements then to see a uh, specialist. And the specialist investigated. And he's the one who come up with the diagnosis that I'm sorry, but this happens quite often. And uh, I believe you'll be deaf in your left ear for the rest of your life. And he said that my... My best recommendation would be that we try to fit you for a hearing aid um, and see if that can possibly help. And that is what the, diag the prognosis was from the doctor. And uh, he said, you know, there's, there's a treatment we can do, he said. But honestly, I've got to tell you, he said, um, I don't expect it to accomplish anything. And he said, and I literally mean, I do not expect it to do anything. He said, uh, but we can do it just so we can say we tried everything there was to try. And so I went through three very painful uh, processes where they stuck a needle in my ear, through my eardrum, and they filled the area behind it with a steroid. And I had to lay with my head a certain way for 30 minutes each time. It was about, I think each shot was two weeks apart for, for uh, six weeks. And, uh, and I was not sensing any kind of recovery. I wouldn't, and the doctor said, well, that, honestly, you know, I told you, I'm not surprised at that. But to make a long story short, I kept saying to Booby, I said, the Lord is going to have to heal me because I cannot function like this. And I can't sing when I cannot hear on my left ear. And you all remember when we were trying to have church during that time, uh, it was very hard for me because I was trying to desperately to set the music up where I could hear it and and everything It's amazing when you hear in stereo and all of a sudden all you're hearing is in mono You can't even tell what direction sound is coming from And uh, so it was horrible and I said Lord you're gonna have to take care of this But I continued to believe God See some people make a mistake they pray and if the answer does not come immediately, then it's, well, I guess the Lord's not going to do it. Uh -huh. yeah. No, it's not about the Lord's not going to do it. God's promised He'll do it. And you need to lay hold on that promise. And you need to know that God's going to take care of it. You're not waiting on whether or not God's going to do it. You're just waiting on when. Yes, amen. And as children of God, we've got to understand... There must be some purpose being served in God's economy. Yes. There has to be some purpose that this thing is dragging out, that it's taking longer. There must be some reason. I don't know the reason. 
That whole thing may have been for a testimony to the doctor. Yes, amen. I don't know. That whole thing may have been because I told him, I said, well, we're praying. I said, I'm believing yes, God to heal right. this mess. I said, I can't function like this. So he knew yeah. that I was believing God. And many of you were in the meeting. Uh, several months ago and I held up my phone and I played the doctor's message for you yeah. and my hearing was back up in my left ear to 97%. Yeah. This is after I was told I'd be stone deaf in my left ear for the rest of my life. So you see, God will do it. He can do it. Sometimes there is some purpose and the wonderful thing is when it's all said and done, when it's all over, you'll be grateful. You will you'll have a better understanding oftentimes why the Lord allowed this thing to, to drag out. Why it didn't seem to come immediately, but uh, God allowed it to kind of take uh, its time. It is not pleasant. Honey, I've been there many times with some things that were very, very uncomfortable and very, very, very painful. And uh, I've been there to the point where the Lord let me go to my deathbed. <coughs> Yes, amen. And But when it was done, I'll never forget the Lord speaking to me one day. And He said, you are going to have a testimony That's right. that very few people have. That's right. And uh, But in order to have that testimony, you've got to go down a road that very few people go down. That's right. You've got to live an experience that very few people have lived. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you read in Scripture, it's funny, some of the miracles that God gave to some people in Scripture. It's interesting how the Lord in the Word of God even allows us to know how long they suffered. Uh -huh. This woman had an That's issue right. of blood yeah. mm -hmm. for 18 years, you hear? And you yeah. got, well, this man was lame from birth, from his mother's womb. Yes, that's right. We don't really need those details per se. Amen. We don't need to necessarily know how long they were struggling with it, how long they suffered with it. Yeah. But when you understand how long they struggled with it, it makes the miracle that much greater, doesn't yes, it? Yes, amen. All of a sudden you say, wow, can you imagine struggling with something for 18 years and then all of a sudden in a minute God heals it and touches it. And uh, when our faith gets engaged, we come to the house of God with an expectation I, I know I do, at least this is how I approach church, especially when I'm struggling with sickness or illness, what have you. I come to church, is this going to be the service? Is the Lord going to do it in this service? Yeah. I have had many, many times, not only myself, but people that I've ministered to who are struggling with things, and they come to church, and all of a sudden, and oftentimes without them even knowing it, Sean, they're not even aware of it. God heals them in that service. There's yeah. something said, there's something done in that service yeah. that helps their faith to connect. You know, and all of a sudden, the Lord touches them, and they don't even realize it. Yeah. And then they go home, and a month later, they'll turn around and say, Hey, you know what? I just realized, literally, I've seen this happen. I just realized it's been a month since I had my last seizure. It's been a month since I had my last episode. It's been a month since I felt pain. And because God just literally right. sneaks it away from them, so to speak, they don't even realize it's gone. That's and then right. time has to pass, and then all of a sudden they'll say, wait a minute, where'd it go? Uh -huh. And it's gone. God has touched them. So we ought to come to the house of God literally with a, a sense of expectation. Maybe today the Lord yes. is going to help me yes. to grab hold of this thing by faith and just latch onto it. And I'm going to walk out of this place without this condition, without this pain, without this discomfort or this illness any longer. Amen. All right. So James is telling us then in chapter 5, there ought to be a natural response to sickness. What is that natural response? Pray. Yes. There ought to be a natural response to our uh, feeling merry or being happy. And what do we do? We sing. He didn't say sing Madonna. He said right. sing psalms. Yes, so obviously these, he's saying sing worship. Yes. 
Yes, amen. You're going to worship the Lord. And, uh, you know, I tell you all all the time, when the Lord blesses me in some little way, somewhere, somehow, you know, I go to a store and they've got what I want on clearance and I get it for a song and I do my little happy dance. Yeah. I am blessed. Yes. I am blessed yeah. every day that I live. I am blessed Amen. when I wake up in the morning or I lay my head to rest. I am blessed. I am blessed. I start singing. And I'm serious. That's what I do. Because that ought to be our natural response. Amen. Our natural response to good things ought to be to give God the glory. Amen. Amen. I've been teaching Tommy for years and years and years. And it was hard at first. You know, a little JW, some of them old habits are hard to break. And I'd say, boy, when the Lord blesses, you need to be the one that says, thank you, Jesus. Amen. You need to be the one out of ten that comes back yes, and thanks Him. And I said, every little, I don't care how little it is, how big it is, we ought to acknowledge God in it and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And, uh, and that's what I do. You know, every little thing, I'm thanking the Lord for it. Amen. Word of God says, praise Him in all things, right? Yes, so amen. I praise Him. Amen. All right, then James goes on and he said, is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with all in the name of the Lord. Notice the priority. Notice the... Uh, I'm trying to think of the word I want to use here. Uh, the order in which things are to be done. I've told you before and I'll tell you again. I believe everything in the Word of God is there for a reason. I don't believe that, there's a, that it's in a certain order accidentally. I don't think the order is... Uh, not important. No, if it's given in a certain order, then that's the way it ought to be done because there's a reason for doing it this way. Yeah. It says, is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders. So the sick need to ask for prayer. They need to ask to be prayed over. They need to ask to be anointed with all. Why? And this is a principle that I literally grabbed hold of 30 years ago, before I pastored my very first church, because in doing so, you're exercising faith. Yes, amen. I've seen God heal people who didn't have enough faith to blow their nose, literally. But they asked to be anointed with oil and prayed for. Yeah. That's all the faith they needed. That's right. Yeah. I've told you the story about my aunt who had had a couple of miscarriages, lost a couple of babies. She had already had uh, two children. And the doctors told her, said, you will not be able to have any more children. Your body cannot support any more children. If you keep getting pregnant, you are going to keep having miscarriages. That is all that's going to happen. And she became pregnant yet another time. And she began to miscarry the baby. And I went over to my grandmother's house and my aunt was there on the sofa and they pulled out the sofa bed, you know, and my grandmother said she's losing this baby that she's carrying. The doctor told her to stay off her feet because it's painful. Uh, stay off her feet and try to just let it happen, let it take its course. Uh, but she came over here so she wouldn't have to be chasing after the other two kids and, you know, caring for her husband and all that. And uh, my grandma Bell said, but faith has asked if you would pray for her, if you'd anoint her with oil and pray. And I said, she did, did she? You mean my Aunt Faith, pardon the name, but that's her actual name. <laughs> this is one example of where just because you name a kid Joy doesn't mean they're necessarily a joy. <laughs> when, yeah. Just because you name somebody Faith doesn't necessarily mean they have faith. Uh, she had left the Pentecostal church and was going to a Baptist church at this time was denying divine healing, was denying the baptism of the Holy Ghost, was denying the uh, gift of tongues, the whole nine yards, the gifts of the Spirit. She, she was full-blown into that whole Baptist theology thing. And yet, she turns around and asks my grandmother, well, when Chuck gets here, can you ask him to anoint me with all and pray? That's all the faith she needed. 
That is all the faith she needed. I wish we'd understand that. Because you can ask for prayer, not necessarily ask in faith. That's right. yeah. But that's all the faith she needed. So I went into the living room. I said, Faith, Grandma tells me you want me to anoint you with oil and pray. And her exact response was, Yeah, well, your grandmother keeps telling me everybody you pray for gets healed. So I figure it can't hurt. I said, Girl, you, you, you done exercise all the faith you need to exercise. You asked for it. I said, that, You've done your job. Now hush up. Yeah. Don't ruin it with a bunch of negativity. Just let God do it. So I anointed her with all and prayed for her. Well, guess what? The pain continued. She still felt it. She was still going to the restroom. And she was passing blood and, and tissue, to be frank and honest. And she told me, she said, see, it didn't work. I said, Faith, how far gone are you? And she said, I think at that point it's like three months. And she said, three months. I said, six months from now, you're going to have that baby. She said, well, I can't. She said, even if God were to heal me, I, he'd have to put a whole brand new baby in there because I've already started to pass the one. I said, I'm telling you, child, you're going to have that baby. Six months from now, you're going to have that baby. And she literally sat there and argued with me. Well, I've already begun to pass tissue. I've already, and all that means is God needs to replace some things. He needs to put yeah. some things back together. It's going to happen. Right, amen. Well, let me tell you, the next morning she woke up, the pain was gone, the bleeding had stopped, everything was over. She proceeded then to go another six months, gave birth to a little baby girl, yep. got pregnant again, yep. had her fourth delivery without incident. Not a problem in the world, not one single problem. This is after being told she could never carry a baby, right? Then, yep. then years later, she winds up yep. divorced and remarried. She and her new husband, he's a little bit older a fella, so she figured he's shooting blanks by this age. <laughs> so she wasn't too worried about birth control. She's yeah. in her early 40s, and she gets pregnant for the fifth time yeah. and gives birth in her early 40s. A lot of women at that age are going to have a little bit of trouble just because of their age. Right. She gave birth to that fifth child without incident in her early 40s. Yeah. When God heals, Sean, God heals. That's right. yes. He didn't yes. just help her have that third baby. No, 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 no. That's he right. healed her. That's because right. she was Amen. able to have baby after baby oh. after baby That's after right. that. And never again have another miscarriage. That's right. All right? And I told her, as all you, you've already done enough. You've already said that all you had to do yes. was Amen. ask for prayer. And if we could learn that, if we could get that into our spirit, yes, and this is why I don't offer to anoint people with oil and pray. Yeah, I don't know. The Bible said if you're sick, ask. That's right. Amen. I need you to exercise that mustard seed faith first. That's... That's how God has ordained it, okay? I need you to do that. So I don't offer. So if you stand there and tell me how sick you are and how you don't feel well about it, and I don't offer to anoint you with oil and pray, don't be surprised. And don't go running off to another church and tell them, well, that preacher wouldn't even offer to anoint me with oil and pray. I stood there and complained and told them how bad I felt. And blah, blah, blah. He never offered to pray for me. Honey, my own grandmother I wouldn't pray for if she didn't ask for it. Yeah, that's right. My Aunt Dorothy was lying in her house in Fort Worth one day. She, she used to get these terrible migraine headaches yes. for years and years and years. Yes, she, she got these migraine headaches. Yeah. And when she would get them, Jack, her whole face would swell. Yeah. And her whole face would swell. It was terrible. Yeah. And she, if she got it while she was on the sofa... If it started coming on while she was on the sofa, she'd lay on that sofa for two or three days and would not move. She couldn't. She couldn't. Yeah. It hurt her to just get up yeah. to go to the restroom. Yes. It hurt her. Yes. She would lay on that sofa, would not go to the bed. She'd lay right there because she was in such agony. She went through this for years and years and years. And one day, this 17-year-old preacher come over to her house because my oldest uh, cousin, Sean, was going to have his final T-ball game of the season. And I was supposed to go with Aunt Dodd and Uncle Travis and uh, Jennifer and all of them, and we were going to go watch Sean play his final game of the season, and he was all of 10 or whatever it was, 9 at the time. And uh, I went over to her house, and Aunt Dot had tears in her eyes, and she said, CJ, 
I've already told Jennifer I'm not going to be able to go to Sean's game. She said, I feel bad. It's his last game of the season. I try to go to at least one game, and I've missed every one. She said, but I can't do it. I'm in such agony. I can't stand it. She said, do you have your oil on you? I said, yes, ma'am, I do. See this? I carry this 24-7. Yes, amen. I carry it. If I stop at a car wreck and somebody says, Preacher, pray for me, I say, I'm a minister. Can I help you pray for me? All right, baby, here we go. Yes, amen. I've got my oil ready. I'm ready. If I come to your house to visit you and yes, you need prayer, amen. I've got oil ready. And she said, Do you have your oil on you? I said, Yes, ma'am, I do. She said, Would you anoint me with oil and pray? I said, Yes, ma'am, I will. Yes, amen. I anointed my aunt Dorothy and prayed. Jennifer came, picked me up. We went to the stickball game. 30 minutes later, my Aunt Dorothy and Uncle Travis walked up to the stands full of people, family members from little team members. And my Aunt Dorothy lifted her hand toward heaven and as loud as everybody in the place could hear, she said, I praise God for his healing touch. She said, he healed me. He touched me. I'm here. And the swelling had gone down. The pain had gone away. Listen to this, children. That was back in 1983. She has not had a migraine headache since 1983. When God heals, He heals. He doesn't just deliver from the temporary pain. He delivers from the condition. My aunt literally has not had one of those migraines since 1983. Yes, amen. So I'm telling you, it works if you do it God's way. Amen. If you do it in the, in the order that God has ordained it to be done. And don't be afraid to ask and ask again. Yes, amen. Even Jesus laid hands on the blind man twice. Yes, right. Hello now. Amen. He laid hands and said, now what do you see? The man said, I see men as trees walking. The Lord said, that's not good enough. I didn't touch you so you could see men as trees walking. I touched you so you could see. He laid hands on us, didn't he? Yeah. A second time. Amen. Yeah. The Word of God tells us, Jesus said, uh, for this cause ought men to pray and not to faint. And he gave us the example of the little woman who kept yes. knocking on the judge's door, the unjust yeah. judge's door, kept knocking and kept knocking and kept knocking until finally he got up and did what uh, he, she needed him to do. Don't ever, every time you come to God and ask Him about anything, you're exercising faith. Amen. There's a false doctrine that came about many years ago that said, if you ask God more than once, then every time after the first time, you're not acting in faith. That is garbage and it is unscriptural. Uh, yeah. That is unscriptural. Every time a child, I love to use this analogy, Every time a child comes in and says, Daddy, you promised to take me to the zoo today. And Daddy says, Honey, I've had such a hard week. It's really been tiring. I think, can't we maybe do it next weekend? But Daddy, you promised to take me today. Honey, I understand that, but Daddy's had an awful hard day. She leaves the room. Ten minutes later, comes back. Daddy, you promised to take me to the zoo today. <laughs> yes, amen. Well, sweetie, we can always do it next weekend, 20 minutes later. But, Daddy, you promised to take... What is that child doing? That child is saying, listen, I know you. Yes, yes. And you're not going to break your... Oh, oh hallelujah. Woo, woo. <laughs> ah. woo. Said, you're not going to break your word to me. Woo. If you said it, you're going to do it. That's right. Uh -huh. Hello now. So you keep asking, Why? Because you don't believe your father's the kind of man that will keep his word? No, you keep asking because you know he's the kind of man that will keep his word. That's right. Uh -huh. Amen. So that's why we go to the Lord and ask Him. I don't care if you come up for prayer 300 times for something. That 300th time, you may walk away whole. Amen. So right. don't ever feel embarrassed don't ever feel like you know you can't or you shouldn't the enemy will come after you oh yeah he'll come after your mind and try to tell you you shouldn't do this you shouldn't do that or you shouldn't do it this way you shouldn't do it that way and uh but you just keep knocking on that door until it opens amen praise god okay all right uh and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. I talked about it before, and I'll, I'm trying to reiterate and go back a little bit from last week. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. 
Children, not everybody that prays, prays the prayer of faith. Yes. Right. I learned this lesson. I'll tell you honestly. I learned this lesson. Uh, not everybody calls themselves a Christian has the faith to believe God for healing. Yeah. That's why one of the gifts of the Spirit, which we're going to get into when we move into our study of 1 Corinthians, we'll be covering the gifts of the Spirit. All of that's in 1 Corinthians. Uh, one of the gifts of the Spirit is the gifts of healings. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that that gift exists, and also there's the gift of faith. Some people are supernaturally endowed by God. They somehow latch on to that gift where they can believe God for anything, anytime, anywhere. And when you have a church, you go into an old-time Pentecostal church with two or three hundred people. And I'm going to tell you something. You'll know. You'll know who your faith-filled people are in that congregation. You'll know who the lady is that if you ask her for prayer, God's going to move. Yes, amen. As if he'd be ordered around by his, his mother, all right? Uh, the Lord going to move. You know who can touch heaven. You know who can touch the Lord. And it won't be necessarily everybody in the congregation. Yes. Part of that is some people are newer in the faith. Some people haven't lived it long enough. They haven't experienced enough. They haven't grown enough. So I'm not. it's not putting down the others. Yes, amen. They're That's just right. not yet spiritually at a place where they've been able to really take hold of some of the principles of faith. But you'll know who the people are. I remember my grandfather years ago, talked about it last week, and he went in the hospital and was supposed to die. The doctors told my grandmother, go home and pick him out of soup to bury him in. Because his uh, gallbladder had exploded and his system had gone toxic. And they told him, said, go pick him out of soup. He wasn't, but at the time, probably at best in his early 40s. Because I, I, think, I think it was before I was born, which he was, uh, Grandpa was already, you know, uh, in his 40s when I was born. So anyway, uh, they told him, you know, told her, said, go pick him out of soup. And Brother Richard King and Brother Harold King showed up at the hospital. Yeah. And my grandfather said, would you gentlemen pray for me? Because <laughs> one thing my grandpa, for all his warts and for all his weaknesses, yeah. he believed in the power of God Same and he man. believed God answered prayer. He said, would you all pray for me? And I'll never forget, Grandpa told me the story so many times, I can yeah. quote it verbatim. He said, that those men laid hands on me, anointed me with oil, and prayed for me. He said, and I could feel the power of God come yes, down on me in that hospital bed. He said, and I was in such agony up until this point that I couldn't even move, he said. And then all of a sudden, I just sat up in that bed. He said, the pain was gone. God delivered him right then and there. And the doctors were astonished. Yes, so I'm telling you, you'll know who the people of faith are in the church. Yes. You'll know. This is why the Word of God said, Is there any sick among you? Let them call for who? The elders of the church. The elders of the church. The elders. You know who the elders are? Yes. Those are the people who paid the price and lived the life. Yes, amen. Hello now. Who've invested time, who've been in this thing for a while. Because i got news for you, as wonderful as Sister Joe and Brother Fred is, who've just been in the faith for the last year, they don't have the same experience right. as old Sister Jones who've been serving the Lord for 40 years. Yes, amen. Or old Brother Bob who's been in the way for the last 25, 30 years. You follow what I'm telling you? Go to those who've been walking with the Lord a while. Yes, amen. Amen. Ooh, this is good. <laughs> We're all right tonight. Amen. <laughs> So, uh, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Be careful who you go to when you want to be anointed with oil and pray for. Amen. I'm serious. I told you last week, I had an experience. I was about 17, and I was at Brother Broch Church down in Bridgeport, Connecticut, at Jesus Name Church. Same church I was baptized in Jesus Name in. And one of my wisdom teeth was impacted. And it was hurting like I've never hurt before in my life. I mean, you know wisdom teeth can hurt like a mother. And that thing had been hurting me and hurt so bad. And finally I said to, uh, I was staying at that time with Brother and Sister Hill, which was an old Jesus name Pentecostal couple. Uh, I sang at their wedding. And they married in their 70s. And uh, I was staying in their home with them. 
And I said to Brother Hill, I said, Brother Hill, would you please anoint me with oil and pray for me? I said, this pain is agonizing. I can't take it anymore. And Brother Hill anointed me with oil, and he prayed for me. And I literally, literally, immediately was delivered from the pain. That was the fastest God has ever done anything in my life. But literally, that pain went from on to off as fast as that man could pray for me. And, uh, I mean, I've experienced God healing immediately like that, but boy, that one just about shocked me. Because it was like, he didn't even finish praying, and the pain was gone. Like the Lord. So, watch who you ask. Go to the right people. As our church grows and we have more and more, and I'm serious, as our church grows, we have more and more people. Go to the elders, honey. Go to those that have a walk with God. Go to those been in the way for a while. And it's important because you want somebody who can not only pray, but who can pray the prayer of faith. All right? All right. The prayer of faith shall uh, save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And then a very interesting aspect here. And if he hath committed any sins, yes. they shall be forgiven him. I started Sunday night. We talked about it a little bit in my message. Yes. How that healing and forgiveness are synonymous. They work together. You cannot have one without the other. Yes, amen. And there's a reason for this. When you understand, boy, now I could get into a whole new vein of teaching that I could really, really, really teach on. When you understand that our human condition is the byproduct of Adam's disobedience, it is the byproduct of the fall in the Garden of Eden, yeah. the fact that you were born into a human body, flesh and blood, right. is the byproduct of the fall. Yes, this is can. why the Word of God said we are born in sin, we're shaped in iniquity. Yeah. That's why we believe in... Uh, in universal sin. In other words, a child is born. That child is not sinless. They're born into sin the minute they're born. Yeah. Why? Because they're born into man's fallen state. Right. Amen. That child is not born into Adam's, the condition that Adam was created. Yeah. Sinless, perfect, a living soul. No, that child is born into a fallen state. Right. Therefore, that child is a sinner. And you know what? There is no way in the world, if you're going to occupy a body, a human body, there is no way in the world that you are not, at some point in your life, going to commit sin. Right. It's impossible. Yeah. The, the human body, our human condition, lends itself to sin. Our fallen state is prone to sin. That's why you see babies, for instance, who are selfish. I don't care. They can come from the most wonderful Christian family in the world. And that kid will see a toy in another kid's hands. And he'll be just old enough to waddle over there and yank it out of the other kid's hands. Because he wants to play with it. He just stole it. Amen. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. He just stole. Yeah. But see, and he was covetous. That's right. But you see, that, that's the nature of our human body. That's what happens when you're in the human form. Right. So this notion, well, that child is sinless. That child, you know, hasn't committed sin. The child doesn't have to commit sin. They're born into a sinful state right, right. off the get-go. Yep. But listen to this now. When God addresses an issue... I'm trying to say this the best way I know how. That is born of our fallen condition, which sickness is an issue that is born of our fallen condition, then there is a spiritual transaction that is married to that physical transaction. Uh -huh. In other words, if God came along and said, you know what, you committed this crime but I'm going to let you out of prison. Oh, mm -hmm. He would have to forgive you of the crime if yes. he's going to allow you then to not have to do the time. Yes, that's right. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to be like a black preacher. I'm going to say it again make it rhyme. We're going to make it rhyme. If you do the crime, you got to do the time. But if God 
delivers you from doing the crime. He forgives you. Uh, uh, it delivers you from doing the time. He forgives you of the crime. That's right. Yep. Sickness is a an issue that is part and parcel of our human condition, our fallen state. Yes. If Adam had not disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, nobody would ever be sick. That's right. That's right. So sickness is the byproduct of the fall. But when God comes along and says, you know what? You're paying a speeding ticket. You're paying a penalty in the way of sickness for Adam's fall. But I'm going to remove that penalty. You don't have to pay that penalty. See, I took care of that on the cross. Yes, amen. Praise you don't God. have to pay that penalty. When he removes the penalty, he forgives the crime. Yes. You follow. Yep. And so there's this spiritual transaction that is married to the physical transaction when God heals. When God heals, it is an act of grace and mercy in anybody's life. Amen. I remember Brother King, uh, Dewey King, over at Riverside Church of God. One of his sons was just about five years old. And this is way back in the day, you know, uh, easily probably 60 years ago or so, or better. And one of his sons uh, was kind of playing with the door. And this is back before seat belts were mandatory and required and all that in all cars and all. And anyway, the, the boy accidentally opened the car door while Brother King was driving down the highway and he fell out of the car. This used to happen every once in a while oh, before yeah. they had child door locks and child right. safety locks yep. and all that. And before you had to wear a seat belt, you know, every time you got in the car. And his son fell out. Well, he wound up in very, very, very serious condition. And Brother King had some relatives that were Christians. And he was sitting there at the hospital. And his son is, is in desperate condition, dying. And Brother King said, Lord, if you will heal my son, I will serve you till the day I die. Yes, amen. I will live for you till the day I die. Well, God healed his son. And Brother King yes, lived for amen. Jesus till the day he died. Amen. And he did it better than most people I know. I'm going to tell you right now. Yep. That man was one of the sweetest most godly Christian man I've ever met in my life. But you see, there is a spiritual transaction that occurs with that physical transaction. Yes. And when God heals you, at the same time, simultaneously, He wipes your slate clean. Says, Sean, you may not even realize it, but honey, you went tiptoeing through the tulips and got a bunch of pollen of sin on you. Got all kind of, you know, you got some stuff this week that you didn't know you got even, but that's all right because it's gone now. I've healed you and I've wiped that away as well. I tell people all the time when we're baptized in Jesus' name, not only does God expunge our record, not only does He remove our past offenses, but He then puts a Scotch guard on our soul. Scotch guard helps to prevent stains from being able to take hold. If you put Scotch guard on fabric, you can spill anything on that fabric, you can put anything on that fabric, and all you have to do to remove it is wipe it with a cloth, and it's going to come off, and there'll be no stain remaining because the Scotch guard stands between what causes the stain and the fabric. When we're baptized in Jesus' name, God scotch guards our soul. It's not that we can't do things that get us dirty. It's not that we can't do things that messes us up. But it's a whole lot easier to clean up. Uh -huh. And when you clean it up, it's cleaned. You don't have a stain remaining. You don't have little blotches here and there because of doing this or having no. Word of God said if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And what? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So not only does He forgive the sin, but He removes any lingering evidence of that sin. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So I explain to people all the time, you know, God scotch guards us as it were in the waters of baptism. And sin becomes something for us as Christians that's far easier to deal with. Amen. It's far easier for us to deal with it than for the unbeliever. 
Yes, and uh, when the unbeliever comes in, for them to respond to sin and deal with sin, they have to believe and obey the gospel. That's right, amen. And uh, and us, all we have, we don't have to be baptized every time we sin. Right. All we have to do is confess our sin, and He is faithful and just forgives. to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right, well, I changed the thingy, didn't I? Something like that. Okay. Then you'll notice that James continues. He says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be forgiven. He says healed. Oh, healed. Interesting. So what James is suggesting, what he's alluding to here, is that there may be some things in our life in the way of sickness that has to do with a fault, a weakness, sin in our life. Mm -hmm. This is why the Apostle Paul talked about people coming to the Lord's table and taking communion. And he said, some of you come and you partake of the Lord's Supper and you do it unworthily. He said, there's issues in your life you need to address before you come to the Lord's table. There are issues you need. And then he goes on to explain. He said, this is why some of y'all were sick. He said, and some even sleep. He said, some have even died. Because they were careless about coming to the communion table and partaking of the Lord's Supper. And they're not discerning the blood and body of Christ. They're, they're not giving the full important value of these symbols, these elements. They're approaching it like in the Old Testament, like David did with the Ark of the Covenant when they transported it into the city of David, put it on an ox cart when God said, no, 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 you're supposed to carry it. The priests are supposed to carry it on their shoulders with the poles yeah. through the rings on the side. You follow? And yeah. so what happens is people get so accustomed mm -hmm. to the presence of God, we get to take it, it for Oh well, you know, I go to church and God's there, woohoo. We get so accustomed to communion, but I tell people all the time, that does not mean that when we have communion, you need to be sitting there saying, oh Lord, I've been bad, I've done this, I've done that, so therefore I shouldn't take communion. That's not what Paul was saying. What Paul was saying was that we ought to first address those issues. If you know you got some things, then you need to clear it up with heaven first. That's why we take communion. Because what it does it brings you to a place where you can now examine yourself and say, Oh Lord, I had a real hard time the last month or so. And I have done a lot of things, said a lot of things, gone places and been with people I probably shouldn't have been with. And I, Lord, please help me, Jesus. If there be anything in me, God, that's offensive, remove it. So I can go to the Lord's table with a clear conscience and with a clear record. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. So really, the Lord's table is designed to help us come to a place of self-examination. That's the whole purpose of it. It's not so you can sit there and say, Well, I'll sit out this one because I've been a bad boy this week. No. Don't, don't do that. Because if you do that, all you're saying is, that you're pretty convinced you're going to be a bad boy next week. Yeah. You're not making any kind of a commitment to fix the problem, are you? If you're just going to avoid the Lord, no. But if we address the issues first, and this includes, I will say, this includes, uh, if you have one against a brother or sister in the church, if you've got a conflict going with somebody in the church, don't you come up to the Lord's table and take communion, except first you go to them and say, brother, we, we've been fighting, we've been arguing, we've been bickering, and, and I want to set the record straight because when I take communion today, I want to do it with a clear conscience. The Word of God said, if your brother offend you, I'm to go to them. So I'm going to take care of this first. I'm going to settle this first. And I'm going to tell you, I've seen many a communion service where people are doing this very thing. In the church. You'll see Sister Jones get up, walk across the church to Sister That's Smith right. over here and hug her neck with That's tears right. in her eyes and say, I'm sorry. That's 
right. I've been acting like a fool. And before I go to the Lord's table, I want to get this settled. That's right. And it's yep. a wonderful thing. When yes, you let is. communion do, when you let the act of communion do what yes. it's supposed to do, yes, amen. it draws the, it, the whole concept of communion is to draw together, to pull together. That's why it's called communion. If you yes. let the uh, ordinance of communion do what it's supposed to, it's going to pull us together. That's it's going right. to draw us amen. together. Amen. Because we're all sharing in that singular common experience. We're all sharing in those singular common elements. The bread and the wine that represent the blood, the body and the blood of the Lord. And that's all to help us come to the understanding. We're part of the same family, kids. We're all part of the same blood, adopted into the same bloodline. And if there's any issues, we need to fix them. We need to take care of them. Amen. Before we come to the Lord's table... James says, confess your faults one to another. I said last week, you might not want to do that in a lot of churches. That's right. You might, you might not want to do that in a lot of churches. You ought to be able to. Yes, amen. You ought to be able to get up in front of God's people and say, I have a terrible temper. I, and I, you all know I've told you a dozen times or more in the last month alone. I talk about my faults and weaknesses all the time. I should be able to do that. You should be able to do it. You should be able to say, I, I, you know, I have a problem with lust. I have a, because I can't pray for you and help stand in the gap for you and help you to find the strength to overcome something. If you can't be comfortable sharing it, let me know you've got a weakness in that area. Yes, amen. How many times you look at somebody and you would never in a million years dream they have an issue with this or that or that or this. You don't know their life. You don't know where their weaknesses lie. But God's people, His family, we ought to be able to be supportive of one another enough and non-judgmental of one another Amen. enough so that you can say anything Amen. in front of God's people. You can confess anything. And the only response we're going to have is... Pray for one another that ye may be healed. Yes, amen. The only response you're going to get from me is, I'm going to pray for you. That's right. So that God can help you to overcome and to persevere. Amen. And then James goes into uh, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. How should we pray? Well, according to Brother Baptist, we ought to pray under our breath, nice and quiet like, so nobody else hears us. Because it ain't everybody else's business what you're praying for. No, you ought to pray like you're talking to a real person about real issues. How's that for putting it as plain as you can put it? Yes, amen. When you go to God, you ought to be able to talk to the Lord the same way you would talk to anybody else. The more important it is, the louder you get. The more, uh, the more uh, emergency in nature, then yeah. the more fervent you get. Yes, amen. Amen. Right. You yes. ought to be able to talk to the Lord. And that is why we pray the way we pray. That's why when we have uh, common prayer, when we have corporate prayer, so to speak, that everybody's praying aloud. Yes, amen. You read in Scripture throughout the book of Acts, you see this is exemplified over and over again. That's how they prayed. Everybody prayed. Yes. Some people say, well, God can't hear everybody screaming at one time. Well, then your God's awful small. Amen. My God's big enough. He can hear everybody screaming and hollering. and He can hear everybody expressing themselves. He can hear people when they're crying. He can hear people when they're moaning. He can hear people when they're groaning. He can hear people when they're shouting and getting happy. And He can deal with all of that at one time. That's how big my God is. So if your God's so small that everybody in the church has to be dead silent so the one person up front can pray, well then, you serve your small God. My God's bigger than that. Amen. And part of what helps us to be effective in prayer is when we put our heart into it. Yes, amen. Don't just say words. I remember one time I was uh, at a hospital in New York City. A friend of mine uh, was coming to our church, and her mom, she was a transgendered gal, and her mom uh, had asthma real bad. 
and she was brought to the hospital one morning. An angel called me and said, um, Charles, you know, they took my mom to the hospital. She was a nervous wreck because her mom had real bad asthma. And of course, in New York City, you can imagine anybody with asthma has a hard time. And uh, I said, honey, I'll be there. And I got ready and dressed. And I was down at the hospital by like 6.30 in the morning. <coughs> her mother's Roman Catholic. And I'm down there because one of my, this is somebody that is important to one of my church members. Yes, that's right. So you don't have to be you laying on that hospital bed. If there's somebody important to you and you call me, Amen. say, Pastor, you know, such and such, don't be surprised when I say, what room are they in? How do I get there? What, you know, I'll, I'll be there. If they're in ICU, I can go in when other people can. Yes, that's right. Because I'm a preacher. Yep. And so I went down to the mother in the hospital. Bless her heart. She's sitting there and uh, in the hospital bed. And uh, it's that early when she's shocked to see me come in. Now, she knew me. And she's shocked to see me. And I sat there with her for hours and hours and hours. Finally, about 10 o'clock or whatever it was in the morning, this Catholic priest comes along. And he walks in the room. Now, I've been sitting there with her for hours, all right? And this Catholic priest comes along in his little garments and his little vestments, you know. And he says, good morning. Would you like me to pray with you? And she said, oh, yes, Father, if you would. And he proceeds then to open his prayer book. And literally, folks, I'm not even exaggerating in the least. And he literally began, our gracious Father. Blah, 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 blah. And he started reading this prayer off like he was so bored. <coughs> And I sit there and I'm listening to him and watching him and I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. This man, Sean, didn't act like he gave a flip about one word he was saying. He was just reading it off the page. And you should have heard the way he read it. it. I can't even imitate it because I can't be that disconnected. But he literally just read it. Our gracious Father, just read it. And then when he's done, you know, he gives her the sign of the cross and all that mess. And she, oh, thank you, Father. And I sat there and I thought to myself, well, isn't it wonderful that the Catholic priest came in and read a prayer that he could have cared less about, didn't have any heart for, didn't, it didn't mean one word he was saying because he sure didn't sound like he meant anything. And this Pentecostal preacher had been sitting here with you for the last four hours. Holding your hand, went out and got your coffee, you know. A little bit of a difference there in there in ministry. Well, anyway, the effectual, fervent prayer. If it doesn't come from your heart, then it might as well not even leave your lips. Well, there's some good teaching right there. If it doesn't come from your heart, it may as well not even cross your lips. One of the reasons that fellowship is so important to the church, one of the reasons we do Thursday night, one of the reasons we have meals after church and what have you, is this. You get to know one another at a personal level. Because boy, if you let somebody call up and say, hey, Jack's had a heart attack and he's over here at the hospital. Oh, oh wait a minute. That's my family member that I sit and I have lunch with and I have, right. I have dinner with him and we yeah. fellowship and I know him. And, you, and I'm going to tell you, you'll pray a whole lot differently for somebody you know Amen. than somebody you don't know. That's right. Right, somebody you love. That's right. That's right. When you've grown to care, when you've grown That's to right. know someone, and you've grown to care for them, all of a sudden it affects how you pray for them. Yes, amen. That's one reason why these mega churches do God's people a disservice. Because you can be in this great big church and let the pastor get up and say, "Well, we have a brother in our church with ten thousand people named Joe Schmo." And he's in the hospital with a heart attack. Let's pray for Brother Joe Schmo. How many people in that church of 10,000 even know who Brother Joe Schmo is? Well, the five or six up front. There may be a few that are kind of part of his little clique, his little group. Because in big churches like that, people yeah. fragment, you know. Yeah. They create these little subgroups. There may be some people in the little subgroup. But honey, all the rest of the people don't even have a clue who the guy is. Don't know anything yeah. about him. Don't have the first idea. This is why fellowship is so important. Because it helps us to get to want to know one another at a personal level. It helps us to develop 
a more intimate, a more personal relationship with one another. And in so doing, it changes our prayer life. Yes, it does. And when things come uh, our way, when things come to others in the church, we pray for them entirely differently than we would if we were praying for somebody we don't know from Adam. Yes, amen. That's right. And then, I'll be talking about this in the future, I'll be teaching on it when we get into more in-depth teaching on prayer. Also, you learn about intercession. And intercession is when God allows you, the Lord helps you to feel for people you do not know. Yes, amen. Yes, amen. I drove past a car wreck one day, a, a truck, a tanker truck, had driven up on an embankment and flipped over sideways. Now, I don't know what happened. I don't know what caused the driver to do that. I don't know anything. I don't know whether he was injured or not or anything. All I know is that all of a sudden this terrible burden come over me for him. He might as well have been my brother. Because all of a sudden I felt this terrible heaviness and I started praying for him like he was a member of my family. I said, oh God, help that man. Jesus, preserve his life. See, God can put in your spirit I didn't say he'll whisper in your ear. I said he'll put in your spirit. That's right. Facts about the case that you don't have a clue about. In other That's words, right. the Lord can drop in your spirit. This man is not saved. This man is not ready. His life is hanging on the edge right now. He, he is near death. And if he dies, he's headed straight to hell. That's right. You need to hold this man up. You need to pray yes, for this man. Amen. This man has five children. This man has a wife at home who's waiting on him to pay the mortgage this month. And you know what I'm saying? God can just literally put that right into your heart, That's right into right. your spirit. And you'll be praying for somebody you don't know nothing about. But you'll be feeling and sensing things about that person. And God just put it at That's the spirit of intercession. That's when God helps you so you can pray what? Effectually. So you can pray fervently. So you're not just speaking words. You're not just saying words. You're not saying, oh, Lord, help that guy, Lord. If he's hurt, then Lord, touch him. Tommy will tell you, when I go past the car accident, every single time, or if I go past any, any kind of a tragedy, a house on fire or, or building, you know, whatever, I start praying. Lord, help those people. God, don't let there be any loss of life. Jesus. If they're not ready to see you, Lord, then don't let them leave this earth, God. Give them another chance. And I begin to pray, Lord, they may have a mother who's a praying mother. And let me be in, in, in agreement with her right now in Jesus' name. And, and Sean, my heart is in it. Because I can't pray without my heart being in it. Because compassion is a trademark of Christian people. And I, I've preached on this in the past, and I'll talk about it again in the future at some point, I'm sure. You want to unlock miracles in your church? You raise up people of compassion. You want to cut miracles off in your church, and you wonder why the Pentecostal movement does not see miracles like it used to see miracles? I'll tell you why. It is because of a lack of compassion in the church. The more judgmental you get... The less compassionate you can be. The more judgmental you get. I can look at a homeless man and have compassion and pray for him. Lord, help him. God, make a way for him. If I'm compassionate. But if I'm sitting there, well, you know what? He just no drunk anyway. He just all he ever wants to do is be drunk, and he lives his life, and and that's what he's chosen. And but, but, and if I get into that judgmental spirit, then you know what I do? I cut off my compassion line. Yes. And in so doing, I render myself useless in praying and interceding for that person. That's right. The Word of God tells us on many occasions. And Jesus, moved with compassion, That's right. did this or did that, and a miracle ensued. Mm -hmm. I have compassion upon the multitude, for they've been with me all day. Go get them some food. Mm -hmm. Lord, we don't have any money to buy food for all these people. Well, what have you got? Five loaves and two fish, bring them to me. And a miracle ensues. Right. Why? 
That miracle came about because of compassion. You following what I'm saying? Yeah. This is why it is so imperative. It is so important. I say it all the time. The only obligation you have to the person next to you, you're not in this church to judge them. You're not in this church to criticize them. You're not in this church to sit in judgment of them. But have compassion on them, love them, support them in their walk with God. I don't know where they're at in their walk with God today. It doesn't matter. Not everybody in the church is going to be a 20-year-old saint that's been in the way for all this time. One of the things that I despise about the whole inner movement, and I was in it. But I had enough sense to know this even when I was in it. Not everybody's going to be at the same place at the same time. That's right. That's it's right. impossible. Amen. If you're a soul winning church, it's impossible. You're going to have babies. Every yes, week you're going to have new babies coming into the church. That means spiritually they're going to be way down the ladder. Yes, amen. And if you just preach conformity to them, you need to dress like we do. You need to act like we do. You need to talk like we do. You need to walk like I do. Yes. You're asking an infant to act like an adult. That's right. Amen. That's right. I remember in my first church, uh, we had a lady named June in the church. And June, bless her heart, she wore pants. When she come to church, she'd wear a skirt because she knew how we believed. Us holiness folk, you know. But she wore a little bit of eyeliner and, you know, and a little bit of lipstick. And she cut her hair. And one day another lady in my church, Sue, come to me and said, Pastor, can I tell you what the Lord has just laid on my heart to do? And I said, what's that? She said, well, the Lord has laid on my heart. I need to go talk to June about that makeup. And I need to talk to June about cutting her hair. And I need to talk to June about wearing pants. And y'all think, you think as straightforward as I am with y'all is something new and that I hadn't been, I've been this way a long time, children. Yeah. And I looked at Sue and I said, Sue, honey, you know what you ought to feel led to do. And she looked, I'll never forget it as long as I live because she was one of them that had them Church of God fake eyes. What? <laughs> <laughs> hate that. I hate that jazz. We've had some people in our church, you know who I'm talking about. They give you oh, what? That, that spirituality that really ain't there. Amen. What, brother? And I said, the Lord ought to be laying on your heart to keep your mouth shut. Amen. That's exactly what I said, to word for word. I That's said, to right. keep your mouth shut. I said, sister, God is not going to speak to you mm -hmm. to go talk to that woman. I said, let me tell you something. As her pastor, uh -huh. I can tell you she's doing fine. That's right. She's growing. She's developing. She's coming along. She may not be coming along fast enough for you, but that's all right because she ain't you. That's right. If you that's know to do end. these things, then you do them. Amen. You leave her well enough alone. Amen. I said, don't you dare talk to that woman about those things. I said, if she needs to be talked to, I'll talk to her. I'm the pastor. That's right. Amen. Follow what I'm saying. Yeah. So this is all, boy, not too bad, huh? Right. <laughs> We're doing all right tonight. All right. So, uh, moving along then. Paul, uh, Paul. James then begins to talk about uh, Elias was a man. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm not even, he's just giving an example. Yeah. He's just talking about the fact that this man, when he prayed, honey, he prayed. Yes. Amen. When he was talking to the Lord, he really tried to talk to the Lord. And when he prayed, uh, God gave rain after three and a half years without rain. Okay, and uh, so I'm not going to go into that because I want to try to finish this tonight. We started a few minutes early, so I'm going to go a few minutes extra, okay? It'll still be the same time frame we normally spend, but I want to try to finish this tonight. Okay. Right, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly. And it's funny because uh, I guess I guess I got to say this. James says he's a man of like passions as we are. Do you know what James is saying? He's saying he's as human as you and I are. That's right. And yet, when he prayed, God sent rain after three and a half years of drought. Right. So in other words, your humanity does not affect your prayer life. That's right. Your humanity, hallelujah, does not affect your ability to touch God. Yes, your, your weaknesses, your frailties, your failings... 
does not affect your ability to move heaven and earth. That's right, amen. Through faith in God. That's what James is talking about here. Hallelujah. Let's move on to the last few verses then of this chapter. Go down to verse 19. Which deals with those who wander from the truth. He said, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him or one help him to return, one help him to get back on the right path, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. This this is an interesting passage. That I could preach me a whole sermon on this. I won't tonight, but I could. If any of you err from the truth and one convert him. Well, brother, that means that if, if you're living a homosexual lifestyle and you're still in the church and you claim to be serving God, then I've got to help you understand that that homosexuality is wrong. One of the biggest mistakes Christian parents make, and it happens every day, all day. And this is why hell, the Word of God said in the last days, hath enlarged itself. Yes, uh -huh. Hell literally has had to add rooms on. Uh -huh. And a lot of it is because of the stupidity of the church. I'm just going to say it. The ignorance of God's people. Honey, if your child comes to you says, I'm gay, Instead of saying, bless God, that contradicts everything of that's, that's godly and righteous and holy and I want you out of my house and I don't want anything to do with you anymore and kick them out into the street, you moron. Amen. What you need to do is say, son, keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't lose your faith. Whatever you do, I don't care who you are. I don't care where you go. I don't care who you lay down with. Do not ever lose your faith in God. And when you kick your kid out into the street, what you do, my friend, is you kick their faith out into the street with them. And a lot of times, the circumstances you kick them into cause them to then lay aside their faith. Yes, amen. The most important thing you can do for anybody is help them keep their eyes on Jesus. Amen. Whatever you perceive their weakness, whatever you perceive their sin, whatever you amen. perceive as being a fault in their life. That's right, amen. You don't ever, Sean, ever want to do or say anything that is going to cause somebody to leave the Christian faith. James said, if anybody err from the truth, you got somebody who's thinking about going into the Mormons. You got somebody working their way into the Jehovah's Witness. You got somebody who, in order to do that, you've got to deny the fundamental truths of the Christian faith. You got somebody who's going into Buddhism. We have people in our community every day because of the foolishness that goes on in the, in the Christian churches who wind up going Buddhist, who wind up going into the Hindu, who wind up going into uh, paganism, who wind up going into witchcraft, who wind up going into Wicca, who wind up going into all these religions. And these people were born and raised in children's church. They were born and raised in Sunday yes, school. Amen. They were born and raised believing in Jesus. This, folks, this is hideous. The truth. That doesn't mean that every little point and every little piece that you embrace as being the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. But the fundamental, the foundation. Yes, amen. If they're denying Christ, if they're denying that He was God manifest in human form, yes, come to die on the cross and rise again from the dead for your salvation. If they're going in, away from that truth, That's the one you want to try to snatch. That's the one you want to try to help That's find their way dead. back to God. Find their way back to the right path. That's right, amen. That's right. If you think for one minute that every little nitpicky point that yeah. you embrace is what this passage is talking about, you're out of your tree. That's right. You're out of your tree. Yeah. Because what would happen if that were true 
We would be like the Jehovah's. Everybody in the church policing everybody else. Everybody looking at everybody else. Everybody determining, well, I think Brother Jackson sinned because he wears short sleeves. And I think Brother Sean's in sin because he wears eyeglasses. And I think, you know, every little... No, that's not what James is talking. He's talking about the core. He's talking about the truth that is able to set you free. I don't care if my kid's a drunk, a drug addict, a homosexual, a prostitute, what he is, who he is. I want him never, ever, 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 ever to surrender his faith in the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Because at, the, at a moment of tragedy or at a moment of desperate need, I want him, the first thought in his mind to be, to call out, Oh, Jesus! Amen. Amen. But you see, the church has taken this passage and many people have taken it so far out of context. If any air from the truth, well, that means if they do anything, I don't define as the truth. Yeah, that's right. No. No. If they start to go in a direction where they're going to deny the Lord of glory, if they're going in a direction yeah. where they're going to deny the the very God who purchased them, that they're going in the direction where they're going to deny the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do what you can to help them find their way back. I'll give you an example. One of my friends on Facebook recently posted a message. And he said, uh, well, it's official as of next so-and-so. I'll be starting classes to convert to Judaism. And this is someone who, I believe he, uh, I can't remember which church he was part of. It wasn't a Pentecostal church. It was like Episcopal or something, you know. And I just wrote him a little note and I said, Honey, as I want to ask you a question. I said, you realize that if you convert to Judaism, you have to deny Christ. You realize that you're going to have to say, Jesus was not the Messiah. Jesus' death meant nothing to me. Jesus did not die and rise again from the dead. You're going to have to say all these things. You're going to have to embrace all these beliefs. I said, are you ready to go there? Think about it before you make this decision, before you make this move. See, if any are from the truth, this person wasn't in the full-blown apostolic truth to begin with. But you know what? He was about to make a choice that was going to put him so far away from it, it wasn't even funny. All I want to do, I want to keep him on the path, because as long as you've got the core, then sweetheart, the rest of it can come to you. That's right. But if you deny the core, then you place yourself in a position where you're not even, you're not even able to find the rest. Yes, amen. You follow what I'm saying? And so this is what James is talking about here. He said, uh, if any... Uh, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, then one convert him, or one help him, help to restore him, return him. Let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin. I'm going to tell you, a lot of these Christian people who want to take this passage and they want to apply it to every little point of doctrine and every little point of belief and every little tiny thing. Sweetheart, listen, while you're looking at me condemning me for being gay, I can look at you and condemn you for being divorced and remarried. Amen. Are we really going to play that game? That's right. Uh -huh. That's right. Amen. Yes, amen. Or can we just look at one another and appreciate the fact that we're all trying to live for God, we're all trying to serve the Lord, we're all trying to find yes, our way, amen. and can we not just do what the Word of God said, let every man work out his own salvation, salvation. with amen. fear and trembling. Amen. Can't you leave me alone? Hey, as long as I keep my core faith, as long as I keep the primary truth intact, if you think I'm wrong in every other area, then leave me well enough alone. God can get to me. The Lord can help me. Amen. Amen. Just, as, you, just as much as He can help you through your error Amen. and through your Jesus. weaknesses Amen. and through your sins and through your faults. Because I guarantee you got them. Oh, yes. Amen. Amen. Amen.